Good morning. Good morning. It's wonderful to see you here. Um, please stand and join me in the call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord because God is good, because God's steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Those God redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. And let them offer prayers and offerings, commitments and all manner of thanksgiving sacrifices. And let them tell the Lord of Jesus with songs of joy. Friends, as we enter into this space, we leave behind all that has happened in this past week, and we center ourselves here in this place and in this community and in this faith that promises that we won't do everything right. In fact, we will do many things wrong, um, but even despite that, God will forgive us. We confess our sin and we ask for forgiveness. Therefore, as a community, let us join our voices together and pray the prayer of confession together, the one that's printed in your bulletins. Holy God, giver of all that is good, we rejoice that you are the source of all that is. The breath of life is a gift from your generous hand. The desire to know and love you is a gift that you bestow. The food we eat is grown in the world you sustain. The community that supports us is called into being by your saving activity. 
Everything we have arises from you. Why then do we complain as though the manna raining down from heaven for us even now is not enough? Why do we worry about your well of living water? Will some die run dry? It is surely our fear and our self-focus that causes us to live as though we do not trust your goodness. Forgive us, we pray. Teach us again to put all our trust in your promises that never fail. Remind us that we are always in your loving care. Open our hearts that we might know your love, which waits for us. And fill us with grace so that our lives might show forth the fullness of your love for all people. Sometimes in this space of silence, we don't even have the words for what to say to God. So we join our voices together now, and we pray the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, who in this place is in a position to condemn? None of us. None of us. Only Jesus is in that position. And what do we know and profess about Jesus? That he came into this world and he walked among us. That he died for us. That he was risen for us. That he is in heaven praying for us. All who are in Christ are a new creation. The old life is gone and the new life is come. Know that all of you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen.
You may be seated. Welcome to worship here at the Presbyterian Church of Upper Montclair. My name is Reverend Caroline Gonzaga. It's my pleasure to be here with you and worshiping alongside all of you while Pastor Greg is out this Sunday. Um, before we move into the announcements, I want to encourage everybody who is, I guess, towards the aisle, if you could pick up that little black pad. Is it black or red? Black. Black. Okay. So the little black pad, fill it out, pass it along, and check out who is worshiping with you this morning. As Greg would say, you need to know who is in the pews. So uh, check that out, pass it back. And of course, if somebody is here who hasn't ever been, hasn't ever worshiped here, who's a, a visitor, please do give them a warm welcome and know that you are welcome here uh, any Sunday and of course throughout the week as well to join in the community uh, and the activity of this community. Okay, in terms of the uh, announcements today, there is um, a minor event happening in a couple of weeks called Easter. Um, so it's a little, a little festival for us. No, I'm kidding. It's our major festival. <laughs> it's the, the Super Bowl for us as Christians. And of course, um, Holy Week starts with Palm Sunday, and then there's Monday, Thursday, Holy Week activities. So do check out the purple sheet in your bulletins to see all of the worship offerings for that. As well, we have something in April, April 21st, uh, PCUM's Got Talent. So there's a call for talent. Uh, I've never been. I, I hope it's not um, as harsh, you know, with the, uh, the judges for <laughs> like America's Got Talent. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of grace there. But if you're interested in participating and bringing your talent, uh, do reach out uh, because we need people to be part of it to throw on the big event. Uh, that's all I have for announcements this morning. Um, so let us continue to prepare our hearts and minds for worship. And now we are going to welcome up the children. animal it could be anything in the world what is something that you love raise your hand yes a stuffed animal you love your stuffed animal amazing what do you love Mark? six flags in disney world six flags in disney world i love those too anyone else with something that you love what about over here you guys don't love anything in the world what do you love Dexter? your sister oh i love that i love it okay so we all have things that we really really love, right? Like, I know for a fact, like, Garrett loves tennis. Loves it. And I love silly little musicals. Especially Into the Woods. So, I also love one other thing. I love Oreos. All cookies, but specifically Oreos. And this has been sitting in my pocket, so it's nice and ready. An Oreo. An Oreo! All right. So yeah, I love Oreos. Oh, and I don't know, probably about as much as you love your sister, or as much as you love your stuffed animals, as much as you love Six Flags. I love this Oreo that much. All right. And 
You know, it's just it's so, it's, you know, it's, it's right here in my hand. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's really good. Yeah. Got to me. ate my Oreo very fast that I don't love it anymore? Just because I can't see it, I can't hold it, I can't touch it, I don't love Oreos like it's the best thing in the whole world? Do you th or do you think the love's gone? Like I, I no longer love Oreos. It's gone. I got it out of my system. You know. I don't know. I still do. I love them. <laughs> I love Oreos even though I can't see them. So, as much as, you know, you love someone, maybe you won't be able to see them all the time. Like, do you love your grandparents? Do you see them every single day? No. No, right? What about, do you love the ocean? If you've ever been there? Oh, I love the ocean, personally. Do you see it all the time, though? No. No? Do you love the idea of things sometimes, like Pokemon? Ooh. Have you ever seen a Pokemon in the wild? No. No, right? But we still love those things, right? We still, like, really enjoy them. No, you don't love those things, right? <laughs> so as strong as your love may be for your sister, or for Six Flags, or your stuffed animal, or for Oreos, or Into the Woods, or tennis, um... <laughs> Just know that, you know, the amount of love that God has for you is far greater. And that's a hard love to understand because you can't see it like I see my Oreos and I eat my Oreos and I love them. Or you can't see it like you see your sister next to you every day being the nicest sibling ever. Or your stuffed animal that you sleep with every night or six flags where you get to go on all the roller coasters and enjoy it. God's love is something that you feel in your heart. And you see, when you see those fun things, or you go do those things, though, that love that you feel for those things is also an amplification, which is a big word, which just means it is a powerful push that you feel all the time, because God loves you that much more. So, yeah, anytime you feel the love for your favorite things, just know that God loves you too, and it helps with that love. All right, you guys are awesome. Thank you. The first reading is from the book of John, chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people loved, dark, loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in, have been done in God. The word of the Lord.
His face full of glory, his eyes full of tears, and he held out his arms, his nail-pierced hands. Is there any way you could say no to this I'm also not Greg Horn, not Pastor, Pastor Greg. I thought that was funny. Okay, um, our scripture reading today from the Hebrew scriptures. So we flipped the order. A lot of times we hear New Testament second and Old Testament first. But today we're looking primarily at the Hebrew scriptures. It comes from the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. Listen now for the word of the Lord. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. This people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that the is many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it up on a pole. And everyone who is bitten shall look at it and shall live. So Moses made a serpent out of bronze and put it upon a pole. 
And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Friends, this is the word of the Lord for which we say, thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, we gather into this space today in this time of Lent, in this time of preparation, in this time in which we ask the question, what does it really mean to be Christian? We gather with our ponderings in our hearts, with our fears, with our sadness, with our hopes, and we open ourselves up to your word and to how you are speaking to us on this day. We pray that your word would take root in us, that we would be able to hear words that would help us to live. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So there is a photo or a video on YouTube that was created by an Argentine comedian some years ago in which he reads sections from what we'll call an intimate diary that he wrote and that he sent to his cousin. In this fictional account, the comedian relates his cousin's impressions of life in Canada, coming from someone who left his native Argentina in South America to live in scenic Canada. In the first diary account, his cousin arrives in Canada late in the summer and talks about how nice it is. It's peaceful and it's tranquil. He can't believe how beautiful and how picturesque it is. His cousin even remarks that he can't wait to see the hills covered in snow. He tells about seeing a deer for the first time how majestic an animal it is. Indeed, the landscape looked just like a postcard. He says, how wonderful it is that I've left my country behind, especially el calor, los mosquitos y la humedad, which translates to the heat, the mosquitoes, and the humidity. Soon the first snow falls in Canada. And his cousin becomes ecstatic. He does all the things that he had seen in the movies for years and years in Argentina. He has snowball fights, and he makes a snowman. He even celebrates shoveling the snow. Say, I had to shovel a little snow, un poquito. <laughs> he doesn't miss even a little his home country of Argentina especially not the heat, the mosquitoes, and the humidity. Fast forward a few months, the snow becomes less and less appealing, as you might imagine. And his cousin starts to complain more and more. He complains about the loud snow plow that passes by his house at all hours of the night. He complains about the car accident that he has because he swerved past the majestic beast, the deer that he had once admired. Finally, he complains because when he's calling his family, who are in the heat of summer, no one is answering because they're all by the pool, enjoying the summer in the southern hemisphere. His dream has become a nightmare. After one winter in Canada, he sells his house and returns to his home country, embrace, embracing what he had once rejected, the heat, the mosquitoes, and the humidity. Now, this Argentine has a funny way of talking about his experience that many of us who are transplants here in the Northeast may have had. I come from the South. I, I actually went to school in North Carolina. I have to work that in after we beat Duke last night. Um, but I, I come from the South, from Atlanta, Georgia. And when I came up for my first year here in New Jersey, 
over 15 years ago, I was fascinated by the same things. In Atlanta, Georgia, we had no shortage of mosquitoes. It's a hot, humid place, especially in the summer, and it almost never snows. In fact, if you've ever watched the news when it snows in Atlanta, there's, it only takes about half an inch to really shut down the entire city of six million people. So you can understand, as a little girl watching movies, I dreamt of making snow angels and snowmen in the snowy hills. Before moving here, I thought of snowy winters as being pretty magical. But after 15 or so winters here, reality has definitely set in. I'll confess that I do complain when I have to clear the snow. I don't enjoy shoveling snow at all. I don't like driving in snow. Uh, and of course, I dream of being in warmer places when it snows. And it bothers me when I call my parents who live in North Carolina and in Florida. Um, and they send me pictures of the beach in the middle of uh, our, our winters. They're enjoying the heat and the mosquitoes and the humidity. Our life journey isn't always what we imagine it to be. In today's reading, in the Old Testament reading that we have today in the fourth Sunday of Lent, we find the Israelites in the desert again and they are grumbling. They have narrowly escaped their exodus from Egypt, and they've dreamt of this moment and how wonderful it would be to not be in Egypt. Now, where we pick up the text today, this is the last of five murmuring stories, five grumbling stories, five complaining stories in the book of Numbers, which is a nice way of saying that they really did not enjoy their situation. When we look at the idea of wilderness as being a barren place, we have to understand that it's not a place where we go and we glamp. The wilderness is really a place where you go out to die. And what we see today is, in fact, that is what's happening with the Israelites. They are wandering in the wilderness. They have lost faith in God, who is this God who brought them out of slavery into this situation that is not much of an upgrade. If this is liberation, they think, well, why not go back to Egypt? Why not go back to the mosquitoes and the humidity and the heat? And just then, as they are thinking that out loud, that's when the snakes show up in this story. Now, during Lent, one important theme that we explore is our own preparation for Easter in the narrative of the wilderness. It's not just a physical place, it's a theological place. And it's a place that we go every year as we prepare for the celebration of the resurrection. The desert can be a metaphor for life's wilderness experiences, a, a place far from comfort, a place that we would not choose to go, a place that does not have any kind of plenitude. It's full of detours, there's lots of disorientation, there's lots of disruption. But strangely, God also shows up in these places. God also abides out in the wilderness. The paradoxical thing is that in these spaces of disorientation and disruption, this is actually a thin space where we are able to experience God in God's strongest form, even where God makes the covenant with the Israelites, God shows up. Part of this lectionary text reading is that God is showing up. Now, last week we saw, if you uh, read from the Old Testament, 
that God showed up in a different way. We got God's covenant with God's people, different kind of text. God setting really the boundaries for what it is to live a life of faith. It means that we have morals that we abide by. We are not able to just do whatever we want. And also that we are not supposed to do life of faith alone. This is a covenant made with a community where we keep each other accountable. We hold each other accountable. And there is an acknowledgement that when we mess up, when I mess up, when you mess up, there has to be an acknowledgement of that and ask for forgiveness. There has to be some sort of a repair. That's how it works. It's not the wild west. It's not the wild wilderness. There are rules that are set up so that we can live as people of God uh, and connected to God. So this week, we see it's not going so well. We, we had those rules last week. This week, we see God, uh, the people don't really like it. <laughs> They're not really enjoying life in covenant, life in community, and the circumstances that are set up. Now, something odd happens in this text. God sets some serpents upon the Israelites. If it were not for John 3, 14 to 20, which includes John 3, 16, we probably would never, ever read this story. Just a, a full disclosure. There is a direct reference from the gospel text to this kind of obscure story in Numbers. It's a strange story that when we read it, we might think, wow, um, that's not so upstanding, God. You sent some serpents to go and punish the Is Israelites. That's not normally what we like to talk about. The focus, as you saw in the children's message, was not God's wrath and God's anger, but God's love in John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his son. We don't normally talk about God sending snakes out upon his people in the desert. But it's what happened, right? It's what we are looking at. And um, what can we get from this story? What can we learn from the people who are wandering out in the wilderness? One thing that I get from it is that when we're out in the wilderness, it might be that God is leading us or joining us there, but it can still feel pretty bad. It can still feel like we are stuck, and that's probably the worst feeling in the world, when you can't move back and you can't move forward, you're just kind of stuck in a place. Episcopalian priest Tish Harrison Warren writes in her book, Liturgy of the Ordinary, about this feeling of being stuck in ordinary life, the practice of being stuck in traffic, and what that teaches us about ourselves and our God. Now, if you have ever believed in the goodness in people and really denied the concept of total depravity, all you have to do is get in the car with someone from New Jersey and get out on the road. <laughs> then, you, then you believe in total depravity all again. Something about getting behind that wheel here in the Garden State evokes all kinds of dark emotions, all the aggression, all the anger. It's all there. It's all there. Uh, myself included. I'm not, I don't live my best self when I'm behind the wheel. Okay? But when we get stuck in traffic, what do you feel? You are going somewhere. You're going somewhere probably important. You're going somewhere to do something important, to be important, to be in community, to meet other people. And when you get stuck in traffic, 
all of that stands still. And you meet yourself in the car and a bunch of other angry, annoyed New Jerseyites. Um, but you really encounter your own loss of control. You cannot control how fast you get there because you have an obstacle. And no matter how you feel about it, you're stuck in, if there's an accident, it shuts down the Garmin state. You're there, right? So that is actually how we can think about life of faith. You're thinking about the pandemic. All of us wanted to zoom through the pandemic. Some people did actually deny that it happened. Um, but when we started out, actually, uh, I think four years ago, uh, this week, when we started out four years ago, we're like, okay, it's going to be two weeks. We can get through two weeks. Weeks turned into months. Months turned into years, right? And a lot of us wanted to fast forward through it. And there's really nothing that you can do in that circumstance. We can't make it go away. It, it, thankfully, we are working our way through it and recovering still. But it's that same sort of thing where you're stuck, you're in a wilderness place, and no matter what you do from your own power, you can't necessarily change the outcome. Tish Harrison Warren talks about wilderness in this way, of the, the idea of being stuck in traffic this way that also relates to the season of Lent, that we also might want to fast forward through. We might want to just skip from Ash Wednesday. Okay, yes, we all die. <laughs> We're, we all die, and we have the ashes smudged on our faces. Um, Fast forward to the chocolate and the bunnies and Easter and, and the lilies. But this whole piece of going through six Sundays of Lent, it's a little bit overkill, right? That's maybe how it feels a little. Uh, she says this, I need the church to remind me of reality. Time is not a commodity that I control, manage, or consume. The practice of liturgical time teaches me day by day that time is not mine. It does not revolve around me. Time revolves around God. What God has done, what God is doing, and what God will do. What do you do when you feel stuck? If we look back at the story, the Israelites seem to let that anger overtake them. They complain because they're not comfortable. They complain against God. They complain against Moses. And in a blink of an eye, we see God sending these serpents to bite them and even to kill them. This is not just about complaining. It's about not trusting God when we're stuck. It's a sin to speak against God, and the punishment of this is death. Now, this is pretty scary. It's a, a great motivator to take up the practice of gratitude, if you haven't, the attitude of gratitude. I remember the first time I taught this text when I was sitting with the children and we did look at the snake text. Like today, I, uh, I think that if we shared this with the children, they would probably say no to snakes. Um, I think they probably would like Oreos more, right? Um, when I shared this with the kids, I asked how many of them liked snakes. And of course, all of them kind of shrieked and, ah, you know, and there was one boy who absolutely loved snakes, so he would have been absolutely fine out in the wilderness. But most of us, if you look at uh, top things that we fear, snakes, it, Kind of top five in the list of, of what you fear. This comes from childhood. It continues into adulthood. Uh, it, to the point where there are blockbuster movies about snakes on planes, which is, amazes me. Um, in a survey here in the U.S., 36% of adults said that their biggest fear is snakes. And actor Nicolas Cage said, every great story seems to begin with a snake. So... 
This punishment frightens the Israelites. It wakes them up to what they need to hear. It scares them enough to turn and to repent. And repent means literally to turn, like to do a 180 in your ways. We see them going to Moses and confessing their sin, which is an amazing thing in, in our day and age to actually admit and take responsibility that you did something wrong. And Moses gives them a plan. Take a poisonous serpent and set it up on a pole and everyone who is bitten shall look up, look up at it and shall live. I don't know how this plan works. It doesn't make sense to me. It's uh, curious in, in our postmodern uh, time. I'm not, this is not a prescription I would give people. <laughs> you know, I would not say to go do this. But it does, in fact, work. What we see is the, is the importance of the story. They feel stuck. They get scared. And finally, they look up. Writer Anne Lamont told the story once that her uh, former pastor would say frequently that uh, bees, when they're in a mason jar, even if the mason jar is completely open, will not uh, really ever get out of the mason jar. They'll bump up against the glass because they won't do one single thing. The bees do not look up. If they did, they would be able to access their freedom. And so it happens with us in our lives when we feel stuck, when we're in the car, in traffic, when we're out there in the wilderness, when we're in the season of Lent. We feel stuck and we're ready to be somewhere else. When we just aren't. In those places in our lives, we can also take control in some ways and to reflect and to connect with God and to connect with ourselves in those moments, to pray and to look up in the wilderness. So friends, receive this message of hope today. When you face the problems of today, the crises of today, the wilderness of today, the snakes that threaten you today, look up and have faith in God. When you get stuck, when you get bored, when you get angry, when you get sad, when you get scared, do not forget to look up, because therein lies your salvation. In the name of the one who was and is and is to come. Amen.
You may be seated. Friends, the earth and all that is in it belongs to God. Therefore, in response to God's abundant grace upon all of us, let us give back a portion of our treasure in this time of offering. Let us pray. God, we pray today to you. In whatever space where you find us, we may be in a space of abundance, we may be in the pit of despair, and we may be somewhere in between in the wilderness. We pray, God, that we would remember your promises, that we would remember the guardrails that you put up for us to live in community, to stay connected to you, and to serve the world. May we uh, present these gifts to you in a space of gratitude, in a space of responding to the grace that you have bestowed upon us. And we pray, God, that you would use these gifts to further Jesus' mission of peace, hope, and love, and justice in the world. Amen. I want Jesus to walk with me. I want Jesus to walk with me. All of
Friends, now let us join our hearts and minds together in this space. Let us go to God in prayer. Eternal God, our story together is one of your unending faithfulness to us, even as we are not always faithful to you. Holy source of all that is good, you have shown us yourself in abundance and mercy, in grace and abiding care. Knowing of your enduring providence, we come to you with the concerns that weigh on our hearts. Today, God, we lift up to you our whole world, a world torn apart by conflict, a world that is beyond our control. We pray for people who are enduring bloody conflicts, for the people of Ukraine, for the people of Israel and of Gaza. We pray to you, God, in this space for peace, knowing that you alone are the source of true shalom, of true wholeness, of true peaceable kingdom where there are those in harm's way, we pray for protection, where we ourselves harbor negative emotions, biases, prejudice. We pray for awareness and grace that we may learn about forgiveness. Teach us how we may serve you more fully in ways we cannot imagine. We pray for those whose needs we know all too clear. We pray for our own struggles in mind, body, and health. And we pray for the struggle community here, for the Presbyterian Church of Upper Montclair. As we enter the season of Lent, we ask that you open our eyes to the needs that are present at our very doorstep. May we see those whose names are known to you and offer compassion and goodwill. We pray for victims of violence, for gun violence in particular. We offer our prayers for those who seek solutions for tr problems that seem to have no solution. God, help us to hang on to hope. Help us not to abandon the work of healing in the world. Help us 
to be healing agents ourselves, to be agents of peace in a world that badly, badly needs it. God, we pray finally uh, that you would enter into this space, that you would hear the murmurs of our hearts, the complaints of our hearts, that you would not look judgmentally about, upon us, but that you would join us in that space and that you would assure us that we are never, ever alone. We lift up to you those things that are heavy on our hearts in this space of silence. God, we thank you because you are our life source. You are the only one that can transform us and turn us from the hurt and the pain towards the grace and the too, true abundant life. We pray all these things in the precious, precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, as you leave this place, we are not promised to enter into a world where everything is figured out, where there is abundance, where there are no issues. We might be actually leaving and going out into a wilderness, though it might not look like that. But even in the wilderness, God meets us there. So go with this promise 
Wherever you go, wherever you find yourself, you do not go alone. You go with a community and with a God who is always with you and will never leave or forsake you. And now receive this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.